James chapter 2, verses 20 to 24. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. Well, good morning, Mountain View. How are you this morning? I went away and developed the voice of God. Do you hear that? Boy, that's loud. So if you are new to Mountain View and not sure who I am, uh, we are so glad that you are here this morning. If this is your first or second time, uh, bless you uh, for coming out to worship on this 4th of July weekend. If you are part of our Mountain View family and you didn't know I was gone or didn't miss me, my feelings aren't hurt. So uh, I was gone for a month-long study break and I just, you hear me say this quite often, that I love our church. Uh, and I love our church because our church values our staff and the health of our staff. Uh, and it was a, a, great, a great 30 days. I spent the first week just here around kind of staycation. Uh, that means you just stay at home and still do yard work and all that kind of stuff. Uh, took the uh, second week and I went to a Catholic retreat center just off of C-470 in Kipling. Uh, had a cabin on 40 acres to myself for about one week. And that was fantastic. The third week, you've heard me say quite often over the last eight years that I go every summer uh, to a camp in California called Opportunity Camp. Been doing that since 1996, and it is a camp that serves kids who are in the foster care system. Uh, so they are in foster homes or they are in group homes. And this year we had 125 campers between the ages of six and 14, and we had 115 staff. So almost had a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. That's not quite rest. So I'll just kind of preface, it's not, not quite rest, but it's a great week nonetheless. And then last week, Tanya and I were blessed with the gift of a cabin just outside of Steamboat Springs and just had some time up on a 40,000 acre ranch, uh, 2,000 of which is a working ranch. Uh, got some, some time up there with the wild cattle and geese and horses and uh, all of that good stuff. Uh, but I am excited to be back. Uh, I am excited about not just this morning, and jumping into the James series that we launched a few weeks ago. But I'm excited about what God is doing with his people. And what God wants to do in your life and the life of our church. I'm so glad that we had a great start to James. John did a fantastic job, if you're here four weeks ago, kicking off and introducing the study of the book of James. So this summer, we are going through the book of James, paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter. And John did a fantastic job. And then you got a chance to see Dan in a suit for the occasion of his daughter's wedding, and Dan did a great job in the second message of James. And then the last two weeks, Matt did a fantastic job as well, talking about how faith without action, without deeds, is useless. And so I'm privileged this morning to just kind of jump right in. Uh, we're near the end of James chapter 2, and if you want to go ahead and get a head start, that's where we'll be in just a few minutes. One of the things I've learned, I've been following Jesus, I would say seriously, uh, for 30 plus years, uh, grew up in the church, grew up in the pew, underneath the pew, on top of the pew, uh, and, and I just loved the church, and I loved Jesus for most of my life, but I have to be honest and say seriously followed him uh, for about the last 32, 33 years. And one of the lessons that I've learned, not so much as a pastor, just as a person, is that the times in my own personal life that I have grown the most to be like Jesus, where my faith has been stretched and developed have not been in the easy times, that they have been in the challenging times, where God is putting me into a situation, or God is calling me to do something, or there's a clear instruction in Scripture that goes against my nature, and God says, this is what I want you to do. And I have to trust and lean into God that He knows what's best. 
And it's been during those times uh, that my faith has grown, developed, strengthened, matured the most. But if I had to be honest, which I think is a good trait for, for pastors, you know, to, to be honest, here's what I've seen in my own life. There are times that I would much prefer God to be like my personal assistant. Not that I've ever had one. You know, so I'm just kind of, you know, assuming what this might be like. You know, somebody who's kind of like the assistant, you know, to the CEO or something. And if I, if I need something, they just go get it. If I have a problem, I shoot a text and they fix it. Pick up your dry cleaning on the way home. You know, all, all of those kinds of things that a personal assistant would do. Just make your life easier. In fact, sometimes I would really just prefer God to be like the perfect Facebook friend. You get me? He likes every status that I ever put out there. You know, there, there's never that, you know, unhappy face. You know, there, there, there's never that sad emoticon. It's just God likes everything. He's that perfect Facebook friend. But the truth is, here's what is misleading. When life is going well for me, when, when life is relatively smooth and there's no speed bumps, there might be some gravel on, on the road, but there's nothing, no major damage, no potholes. Life is basically pretty good. It's smooth. There's a tendency for me to think, oh, absolutely God exists. God loves me. And because life is so good, I must be walking in faith. How else could I explain that? How else could I explain all these good things other than I must be walking in the middle of God's will? The message that James has been developing throughout James chapter 1 and 2 is that might not even be faith at all. It might not even be the kind of genuine faith that God is calling for people who follow Jesus. So this morning... Uh, we're going to look at a rather startling passage out of the Old Testament. It's the person that, that James uses as an illustration in James chapter 2. And so if you're here this morning and, and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're kicking the tires, you're test driving Christianity, we say this quite often, this is a great place to do that. That we don't expect everybody who comes here to be 100% on board, to be you know, 100% convinced. In fact, this place is a safe place to examine, to test whether or not you really do believe this Jesus stuff. But if you're here this morning and you have signed up to follow Jesus, then what James is writing is a challenge. It's James saying, don't deceive yourself. Don't, don't fall into the trap of thinking that you really are following God. Here's what it looks like. And so the passage that we're going to look at before we get to James chapter 2 comes out of the Old Testament book, the very first book of the Bible. It's called Genesis. And oftentimes when we read the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the left side of your Bible, and, and you read the stories, so you read the story of Moses and Noah, and, and you have David who kills Goliath, and you've got all the battles, and, and, and all of those things. It's very easy to read the Old Testament and, and just read it as kind of facts. Okay, that's a fact, you know, that's a person, that's a place, that was an event. You know, that's a real place geographically. And we oftentimes read the Old Testament, and we read it just kind of as a parade of facts. And we miss something very important about the Old Testament. And that is the Old Testament is a story. Yes, it's history. But it's a story of God's involvement with God's people. It's how does God interact with those who follow him. In fact, the study of God is called theology. And so when we talk about stories in the Bible not just having historical significance, but theological significance. What we're talking about is the stories in the Bible help us understand God. The mind of God, the heart of God, how God interacts with people. And that's the story we find James using in James chapter 2. It's the story of a fellow named Abraham. If you've been around church uh, much at all, if you grew up in church, uh, you've heard of Father Abraham. And so we're going to take a little bit of a, a run through the biography of Abraham before we get to James chapter 2 so that we can understand who Abraham is. So what I've done is I've listed off some of the characteristics, some of the kind of the key events in the life of Abraham. Now, to be fair, to be kind of historically accurate, we're calling it Abraham's background. Uh, but half of this, he's known as Abram. 
So if I use that word, don't get confused. It's not another person. It's Abram. The name change we'll talk about when that happens. And so in Genesis chapter 12, if you want to kind of keep a timeline, in Genesis chapter 12, we have what is referred to as the call of Abram. So this is when God speaks to Abram. And Abram is now living with his father, all of his family. Uh, They're living in a town he's probably spent most of his life. Uh, His business is there, his ranch is there. And Abram is living a pretty good life. And God comes to him and says, Abram, I've got a task for you. I want you to leave. Now, at this point, most of us would ask a follow-up question. Where? But God doesn't tell us. God just says, I want you to trust. I want you to go where I will lead you. And so Abraham hears the call of of God, and, and Abraham follows. That's Genesis chapter 12. By the end of Genesis chapter 12, you have what's referred to as the lie. So let me introduce you to Abram's wife, Sarai, who later becomes known as Sarah. And so what we find in Genesis chapter 12 is that Sarai, Sarah, is a very beautiful person. So beautiful that as they're approaching Egypt, Abram says to Sarai, if Pharaoh, who's the most powerful man in the world, if he takes a liking to you, which he most likely will, and someone asks you, Is this your husband? You tell them you're my sister. So he encourages his wife to lie. In the same chapter that God speaks to him and calls him to follow. So that's the lie. The rescue comes in in chapter 14. So uh, Abram has a nephew named Lot. Lot is a a younger man. Lot's probably like much younger men, a little bit impetuous, not so respectful. And so he gets in trouble in two towns, perhaps you've heard of, called Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abram steps in and he rescues his nephew. And then they're looking at all this land that's now available to them. And, And Abram says, let's split the land. Lot, being the very conscientious young man that he is, chooses the best land. Kind of just thumbs, you know, Abram says, hey, you know, hey, uncle, thanks for saving me, but I'm going to take this land here. And then you have the covenant. So this is God a second time speaking to Abram. This time, however, it's not a call to go, to follow. This time it's a promise. When God first spoke to Abram in chapter 12, when he gives him the call, Abram is 75 years old. When God speaks to him again and gives him a covenant, this time it's a promise. He says, Abram, you and Sarah, even though you've never had children and you're really old, you're going to have a son. And I'm making a covenant, more than a contract, a promise with you, that this son is going to have children and then grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and you are going to be the father. Your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. The covenant. However, this doesn't happen in the next nine months, nine, you know, nine, 19 months, next couple of years. And so Abraham and Sarah become impatient. And something happens, the consequences of which we still live with today. Abraham, Abram and Sarah become impatient. And Sarah's looking at herself thinking, I, I, don't, I don't really, you know, the first time God told me, I thought it was kind of funny, but, but now we need to get serious and do something. So why don't you, Abram, be delicate about this. Why don't you have relations with our servant, our handmaiden, Hagar? And so Abram does. And Hagar gives birth to a son called Ishmael. To this day, you have three major religions in the world that that have roots that they trace back to Abraham. You have Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Ishmael and the future son of Abraham and Sarah have fought ever since. The impatience. And then you have the name change. And so God, God says now to Abram, you are going to be called Abraham. 
And he reiterates the covenant that you're going to be the father of many nations, have many descendants, and he changes the name of Abram to Abraham. And then you have, in Genesis chapter 21, the son of promise. Sarah, who has been barren, who thought she would never have children, gives birth to a son they call Isaac. Which leads us to Genesis chapter 22, which is the background, it's the story that James will use in James chapter 2. Because Abraham and Sarah have just had their first son. And then God does something rather startling in the very next chapter. I'm not going to put it on the screen, but I would like to read it to you. I know many of you have your Bibles. It's Genesis chapter 22. And I just want to preface this, this story. We're not going to try to over-spiritualize it. We're not going to try to make it into a metaphor uh, for, you know, there's a point in here and this is maybe just an allegory that is in the Bible. This really happened, I believe. And the word startling I use on purpose. Because if you've never read this story before, if you've never heard this story before, I know what you're going to think. Is God crazy? You know, I, I thought God was a God of love. I, I, I thought God you know, was a compassionate God, and, and you are going to get a little worked up. So I hope if you're on blood pressure medication, you know, you, you've taken that this morning, uh, because I know what it does to me. It challenges a conventional thought of God. So here's how it goes. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, does God tempt anyone? You've heard that in the book of James. No, God doesn't tempt anyone. You know, God, God's not going to put a, a lust or, or, or something like that in front of you. Will God test you? Absolutely. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here am I, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Let's just stop there for a moment. This is God speaking to Abraham. And I don't know how it makes you feel when, when, when God kind of really builds it up. Abraham? Take your son, oh, by the way, your only son with Sarah, whom you love. Why not just say take your kid? You know, why not just say take your son, take Isaac, and sacrifice him? Verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up, and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and he placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up, and he said to his father Abraham, now this gives us a clue how much time later this test happens. Because in chapter 21, Isaac is born. In chapter 22, he's talking in sentences. So he says to Abram, he says, Dad, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? This tells us two things. Isaac has grown up. He, he's not a, an infant, a toddler. You know, he's probably a... A little young man. And this is not the first time that he and Abraham have offered a sacrifice to God. He says, Dad, we've done this before. We're missing something. We're missing the animal. Abraham answered, verse 8. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. 
And he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. What do you make of that? That angel of the Lord, verse 11, called out to him from the heavens, Abraham, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, he took the ram, he sacrificed as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, he, it will be provided. There are certain parts of the Bible that we can't, explain away we can't look for some you know deep and hidden meaning this was a story that really happened and abraham who who starts off by leaving everything he's ever known for a place he doesn't know where he's going finds himself on the top of mount moriah about to sacrifice his son And why does Abraham get to that point? There's a very important line that perhaps you missed. It's something that Abraham said to his servants. He said, stay here with the donkey. Watch my donkey. Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. That's the sacrifice. And then we will come back to you. When Isaac asked his dad, Dad, we've done this before. I I see the wood, I see the fire, I see you've got the knife, but where's the animal? Did you catch what Abraham said? God will provide. There was an underlying assumption with Abraham that, that God would step in, that God would provide, but even if he didn't, he still raised his hand. How can you explain that? I believe Abraham had a faith that went beyond just believing facts. He had a faith that trusted the inherent goodness of God. Do you understand the difference? Abraham believed certainly the facts about God. You know, he, he sees his son that he thought he would never have. He, he left his home and he went into foreign territory and God God gave him a new home. Abraham understood the facts. This is not the first time that Abraham is tested. But every time that Abraham had been tested, it did more than just reiterate the belief in the facts. It reminded him of the goodness of God. And so here's the story of Abraham. God, I know what you've promised. You've promised Isaac, and and you've promised that through Isaac, I'm going to have grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and and I'm going to be the father of many nations. Uh, I know what you've promised, and I understand what you're asking me to do. And those two things seem incompatible. Ever been there? You ever been there? When God, God asks you to do something you feel God leading you. There's a, uh, th- there's a nudge or a whisper from the Holy Spirit. There's a clear instruction in Scripture. A- and you have what you believe God is calling you to do, and it seems at odds with clear promises from God. What do you do in those moments? That's the backdrop to James chapter 2. So James is writing to believers, to Christians, most of whom have a Jewish background because when he talks about Abraham, he refers to him as our father, Abraham. And so he's writing to people who are familiar with the history of Abraham. And he says, I want you to understand what faith looks like. And here's the main point of James, that genuine faith, genuine faith is a faith that always leads to a changed life. 
It's not the intellectual faith that, that Matt talked about a few weeks ago. It just simply believes things. It's not intellectual faith plus emotions like the demons who believe there's a God and they shudder. It's a genuine faith that merges two things. It merges an act of the will. I make a decision with action. And so here's James. James chapter 2. We'll pick it up in verse 20. James chapter 2, verse 20. If you find the book of Hebrews, James sits in the shadows of the book of Hebrews. James chapter 2, verse 20. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And here's a really cool line. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous, made right with God by what they do and not simply by faith alone. That genuine faith always produces a changed life. One of the things I've discovered in my walk with Jesus is that the Holy Spirit who as part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit is our comforter, comes alongside, you know, encourages us in tough times. But, but he is also the equipper, the teacher, the convictor. That the Holy Spirit will oftentimes use a multitude of means and methods to get me to a place in life where God can begin to shape and teach me. And oftentimes, those places that the Holy Spirit gets me into are places that I would naturally avoid. They're called tests. They're called difficulties. They're called challenges. They're called something that in my mind does not make sense. It's Abraham trying to reconcile. How can God, on the one hand, make a promise that I'm going to have a child, and this child's going to have children, and they're going to have children? How can I reconcile that promise with the fact that God has asked me to sacrifice him. That oftentimes, the Holy Spirit will get us to a place of testing. I believe it's, it's no coincidence that when James... And he says, consider it pure joy. What, a, what wonderful language. You know, pure joy. You know, they're, you know unadulterated, 100%. Consider it pure joy when your faith is tested. Because you know it's the testing of your faith that produces in you the endurance that you need. Consider it pure joy. From the moment that we're born until really the day that we die, we are tested. Our children, you know, they're not even a couple hours old. And they're running tests on them. You know, they're, they're testing their hearing. They're testing their vision. You know, as you get a little bit older, you know, they, they screen your cholesterol. You know, they, they test your blood pressure. You take a driving test. You take a personality test. We are tested our entire lives. Why should we think that when it comes to our, our faith life, our spirit life, that we would not be tested. And James says, don't you understand that to really un to kind of test, to, to experiment, to find out if, if you really believe what you say you believe, you don't discover that in good times. It's when it's tested. And I love what he says about Abraham. He says his faith and his actions were not working against one another. That's been my story every now and then. That what I believe, what I know, and what I say or what I do are sometimes like sandpaper. They're working against one another. James says, no, Abraham, his faith and his actions were working together. They were compatible. And so this testing produces in us the maturity 
that God desires. Here's something I can promise you. Almost promise. I don't want to, you know, never say never, never say all, you know. So maybe, but most likely, I, I can promise you that your steps of faith will not be the same steps that Abraham had to take. That God will not ask you to walk exactly in the steps of Abraham to do everything that Abraham did. Pretty confident of that. But I am confident as well that God will ask you to take a step somewhere, somehow. It may not be to leave everything you've known, go to a place that he's not going to tell you about until you get there. It may not be to, to wait for a child until you're you know, 100 something years old. It may not be to sacrifice that child. But God may ask you to take a step of faith when it comes to a relationship. To start one. To end one. It, it may ask you to take a step of faith when it comes to your career. When it comes to retirement, when, when it comes to raising your children, God will always ask you at some point in life to take a step of faith, to lean into him, to have forward momentum. So let me close with two questions. And they have to do with steps of faith. The first one that I want to ask you about is your last one. What was the last step of faith that God asked you to take? Was it today, last week, a couple months ago, a few years ago? What, what was the last one that, that God asked you to take? And how did it turn out? Did you lean in? Did you lean forward? Did you stall? Did you avoid how did God respond when you took the step of faith? When James uses Abraham as the example of obedient faith, the time that Abraham is, is asked to sacrifice Isaac is not his first test. It's not his first step. It's one of many that Abraham has taken. We suffer from something that I call spiritual amnesia. And so we don't necessarily remember the last time that we did something difficult, stepped out of our comfort zone, and how God provided. What was your last step of faith? And you're probably a step ahead. What's your next step of faith? What is God stirring in you right now? What are you reading? What are you listening to? What, what are people who are in your life speaking into your life? What, what do you sense is next? What is God asking you, calling you, challenging you to take that next step? Now, let me, let me be fair for a moment. I, I know what, what some of you are thinking. I don't know. That's okay. You, you might honestly be saying... I, I don't sense God saying anything to me. I'm not reading anything in Scripture. I'm not hearing you know, any voices from God. I, I, I don't really have that stirring. And let me say two things. First of all, that's not unusual. That's okay. But second, ask. Ask. The, the God that I serve, I believe when we ask, he answers when we knock. He, he listens and he opens. And so if you're at a place in life in your walk with Jesus in your, in your faith development and, and you feel kind of stalled or plateaued, you feel dry, you, you don't have that sense that God is, is calling you or asking you to do something, ask him what it is. And here's what I've discovered. God has plenty. He probably won't back up the dump truck and dump it all on you at once, okay? He may just give you a couple things, but God has something. And so if you don't know what your next thing is that God's asking you to do, ask him. And then believe that when God shows you and you take that step, you raise your hand, that God provides. Genuine faith always produces a changed life. Let's pray.